Welcome to another RDWorks Learning Lab. What we've got on the screen is a return to something we started about um, half a dozen sessions ago and I've been a bit sidetracked with other things, mainly a lot of work that's come in and uh, people have been paying me to come out of retirement. I have found a little bit of playtime um, but not to concentrate on a continuation of the engraving theme which we started off. Although I was absolutely amazed that um, this little cheapy Chinese machine could do something as interesting as this 3D engraving. Now a guy who I have a lot of correspondence with in the States called Chip Williams has got a, a 60 watt machine and he was good enough to wire up his machine and run this grayscale test panel that you see at the bottom here on his machine for him. And at the same time produced a picture for me to show me exactly what was going on on the machine. Now what you see here, this white panel here is zero current and the black panel here is maximum current which was equivalent to his setting of 70% whatever that was and that's probably about 60 watts. So what we're seeing here is zero power and 60 watts here. Now if this is zero power and this is 60 watts what on earth is going on here? You might ask why am I so interested in this picture of what's going on with this grayscale? Well the answer is what's really puzzled me is my picture here because as it gets deeper it gets coarser and coarser it's really quite a rubbish finish. But the most interesting thing about it that I can see when you look at it in detail is this vertical granularity that you see here. It's almost like there is a coarse piece of hessian or cloth in the background that's been laid over this image. And look there are vertical lines wherever you look and they're not random dots, they are sets of vertical lines. So every time a scan goes backwards and forwards it seems to be changing power or doing something in a pattern which is completely vertical to the picture. And that's the thing that's really, really puzzling me. What's going on? Can I make this picture any smoother and cleaner? What is it that I've got to do? Now I did this in one hit and various people have sent me information from Trotec and other companies that do this thing and they do four, five or six runs across their job. One of the best machines on the market for doing 3D engraving is supplied by this company called Kern. I mean they specialise in this sort of business. Do you notice anything about the background? They've got lots of vertical lines in them as well. It's not quite as smooth as you thought it was when you first looked at it. Your eye is immediately taken by the 3D-ness of the picture. But I'm looking beyond that at the quality of the background. And as you look into the background, you see it gets worse as it gets deeper. If the top machine on the market can't get a smooth background, then I don't think I stand much chance. But that doesn't stop me trying to understand what's going on. This laser is a DC controlled tube and that immediately gives me the impression that it should be smooth. And for example if you reach a certain shade of grey and that grey remains consistent then I would have expected a smooth finish. Now it might not be smooth because of the scan lines but that's something you can deal with because you can take the beam out of focus and you can overlap the scan lines. But there's something going on here with the principle of glass tubes that even the best machine on the market doesn't seem to be able to overcome. That's what really today is all about. Trying to see if we can discover what it is about these glass tubes that we're running that can cause this problem form. Now it's not helped by the fact that this is probably only maybe two or three inches in size 
whereas the other picture we looked at was probably something like about eight or ten inches in size four times maybe four or five times bigger so that would help if I was to make the picture bigger. Now there are all sorts of strange details that I don't understand about this trace but uh, essentially what you can see is that the machine current steps up and down in relation to the grayscale that's down at the bottom here. So we're starting off at zero current going up to uh, black which is the deepest cut at 70%. Now 70% power on a 60 watt machine is probably full power. So full power is about 25 milliamps. So let's assume that this top blue line here represents about 25 milliamps. So therefore we've got white at zero and then maybe 5 milliamps, 10 milliamps, 15, 20, 25 milliamps all right so those are the approximately the steps that we're looking for here but we've got this strange anomaly here where it's aiming for about 5 milliamps the first step so since I did this work and looked at this graph for the first time and tried to puzzle out what it meant I've done some research work in the background and I've come across a phenomenon which one or two of the better manufacturers have specified that their tubes pass through. They claim it as a great feature. It's called pre-ionization. Now let me just show you what I mean. Now here we are at the Recce website. Now it's a pretty reputable website. I think you'd probably agree. They make some of the best quality tubes. And if we zoom down and we take a look at one of the things that they talk about in their working performance cutting function and engraving function and one of the things that they mention in the engraving function is that it is very good well you would say that about your own tube wouldn't you uh, when the working current is four milliamps and the tube is in the state of pre-ionization the laser can be used for high frequency impulse engraving which is where I got the title from for this particular session. Now, if you go and look to find out what high frequency impulse engraving is, you won't find any reference or description of what it's all about on the big www. The only thing that happens is it keeps referring you back to places like this where the words are mentioned. Now I've written away to Recky I've written away to my tube supplier. I've written away to EFR, who also, if we look down here, it says the CO2 laser tube has excellent engraving performance and can achieve a high frequency pulse engraving under the 6 milliamp current. Now the key words here are high frequency. So that the problem I have with these words is it seems to contradict the concept that I had that this tube was all about and that was that this was a, a DC, a direct current driven, t driven tube. It was not a pulsating current, it was a fixed current. In other words, when I asked it to deliver 5 milliamps, it would deliver 6 watts. When I asked it to deliver 25 milliamps, it would deliver 60 watts. A nice simple straightforward expectation. Well I'm afraid that's been shot down in flames because it would appear that this is not a steady state machine. It is a pulsing machine. Okay so we've seen that several manufacturers are boasting about the fact that their machine can do something called high frequency impact engraving but nobody is telling us what high frequency impact engraving is. I've sent emails to manufacturers to try and find out what this is all about and my answer has been zero and that's worrying because nobody's prepared to tell me what this region is all about. You can't find anything out about it on www. I'm afraid my curiosity forces me to look for myself now I'm not an electronics engineer, I don't have an oscilloscope, 
so I can't go poking in the, around in this region for myself with anything electronic. So now I'm going to have to try and produce a mechanical analog to try and see if we can track down what that frequency actually is. And I believe that the key to answering that question is acrylic. It's the most wonderful material we have for researching this CO2 laser. OK, well, here we are at the machine. and I'm going to run my first program. Now, basically, it's just a series of straight lines that runs back. Well, it runs across like this. And I've got the speed set to the fastest that this machine will run, which is 500 millimeters per second. I've started my line here and I'm running over the sheet of acrylic and stopping way over here. The reason I'm doing that is to make sure there's no acceleration factors involved and that when I run across the acrylic it will be at a constant speed. And what I've done, I've set my power to 9%, 10%, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 and I believe 16%. So my air assist has turned right down now. There is positive pressure coming out of the nozzle so there'll be no chance of anything going back up to the lens. Um, but I want it as quiet as possible because I want you to listen to the sound of the beam as it does these various passes across. Now the first one is 9%, so it would be 9, 10, 11 and 12. The first four, I suspect you will hear that they will make quite a loud hissing noise. And then when I get into 13, 14, 15%, you'll find that the sound goes silky smooth. So. Let's just see what happens when I run the program. So I'm just going to turn the extraction on while it's doing the numbers. OK, well that's my first test. OK, now my second test is to test for something completely different. And I will explain what I'm doing with this test uh, when we get to do the measurement side of it. Now I'm running this test at various speeds. They're all with 65% power, um, which is quite a high cutting power. And I'm running them at 15, 20, 25, 30 and 35 millimetres per second. Now that's worked out just about right because I wanted to make sure that I used different speeds but each one of them fell out. This one hasn't quite fallen out. I may have to push this one out. Okay, test complete. So let's go and do some measurements.
and there's 14 percent and there's 15 percent and there's 16 percent Okay, now while we're reviewing what we've seen so far, I'm leaving this video running in the background so that you can just take a look at the way that the core of the beam builds as the power increases. And at 14%, the characteristic of the beam flips from this unstable pre-ignition phase to a proper full beam. Having established that this high power, high frequency, pre-ionization phase does exist and that we've established where it is on my particular machine it's between 10 and 13 percent that's the usable band that I've got to play with it may be different on your machine um, each manufacturer seems to be claiming a different current for this phase existing some people have said four milliamps some have said six milliamps whether it's something to do with with a resonant frequency within the power supply or whether it's something to do with the mix of the gas or the anode and cathode it could be any one of many things that influences this frequency and the range at, over which it occurs so now we've established that we've got an unstable high frequency at the low power end of the range what happens when we drive into the so-called stable part of the operating curve when I was doing some work with thin acrylic just recently I was seeing distinct lines on the edge of the cut and they were at such a regular interval that I've had to ask the question is this stable phase actually stable or is it pulsing? My second test was to try and establish just how stable the beam was when it was in its proper cutting phase. My cutting test was purposely set up to run at a fixed power there was no chance that changing the power was going to do anything to the working beam. Here are the results that we're looking at at the moment. Now looked at individually, they don't make any sense at all. So what we've got to do is just draw them together in the form of a graph so that we can see exactly what's happening. Now we clearly saw that we had pulses in our uh, beam up to about 14%. And after 14%, the beam went perfectly smooth. So this is a bit of a puzzle to me. We've got pulses when we do a straight line cut. They're obviously not coming from the laser beam itself. So there must be some other mechanism coming into play to cause this, let's call it a rough edge. I mean, it's not really rough, but there's definitely signs of pulsing on the edge. So what on earth could be causing it? Well, my first reaction would be, oh, it's a stepper motor. So let's do a little teeny weeny bit of investigation into the stepper motor itself. Well, I've done a few measurements and a little bit of research on stepper motors used on my machine. And I find that they're NEMA 23 motors, which basically have got 200 steps per revolution. Um, I've also measured the drive wheel and the belts on my machine. And effectively, there is a 12 millimeter driving diameter. So the belt moves 37.7 millimeters for every revolution of the stepper motor. So when you divide 37.7 by the 200 steps, you get an effective step dimension of 0.188 of a millimeter. That's almost 0.2 of a millimeter. Now to put that into perspective for the non-engineering types, that's about if you could lay four human hairs side by side that's approximately what we're talking about it's still a very small step dimension but that is huge in relation to what the machine is capable of so let's just carry on a little bit further 
you can either drive a stepper motor in its natural form i.e. times one and you get 200 steps there will be a drive system which allows you to drive it times two which means you get 400 steps per revolution or there is a micro step mode which I believe can divide each step into 256 which means you get a horrendously huge number of steps per revolution and the increment that would be moved would be infinitesimally small. So the machine specification says that uh, it's capable of delivering 4,500 dots per inch and when you convert that through to millimetres um, that comes out at 0 0.006 millimetres per step that's six microns for every step which is a very very small amount. Uh, the machine also claims to have a positional accuracy of better than 10 microns 0 0.01 of a millimetre. We we'll make a bit of an assumption here that we're going to subdivide this machine down into 5,000 steps per revolution. So if we divide 37.7 by 5,000 steps we get about seven, seven and a half microns which is in the right sort of region. So what we're saying is here um, this is where the machine is performing. It's roughly putting in 5,000 steps per revolution. Now these steps are so small that really you wouldn't be able to measure them and that is definitely not <laughs> the problem that we're looking for. Now let's make a huge leap of imagination here and let's just assume that the 200 steps that are natural per revolution somehow are dominating. In other words that the stepper motor wants to jump to its nearest step as soon as it gets near it and you know it says sod the micro steps. It's very unlikely but that's the only way that I can imagine this having any sort of credibility. If we were to look at my 15 millimeters a second and we would say right there's a step length of 1 200th which is 0 0.188 of a millimeter and we divide that 0 0.188 of a millimeter into 15 millimeters we shall get 80 but that really says 80 pulses per second so that gets us back to a frequency and if we do exactly the same thing for the other speeds we get this range of frequency that could exist. Now those pulses are far too high and they just don't match the graph that we've already seen. So I think we've got to discount the stepper motor as being responsible for this roughness as I call it because there is no correlation between these frequencies and what we're observing. What other possible mechanism could exist? Well after all the theory we're going to have to go and venture into the real world. I need to describe what you're looking at here because it's not immediately obvious. The bar across the page is in fact the edge of a piece of 2mm acrylic. The piece of acrylic is about 2 inches wide and you can see in the hazy fuzzy background the back edge of the piece of material. This front edge here is in focus and just above you can see the nozzle and the nozzle is actually cutting a groove just inside the front edge of the piece of acrylic so that I can see approximately what's going on. Having decided in theory that it wasn't anything to do with the stepper motor the only possible thing that I can imagine was something like the edge of a cliff falling off in other words the beam starts to overlap a solid piece and then chunks away and if you like a piece cuts away and then you move on a little bit further and another piece cuts away. In other words the cutting process for acrylic is not a continuous process. So I decided I'd take some close-up video of a cut taking place to see whether or not I could prove that. So this is our first test at 10 millimeters per second. Now nobody can observe what's going on at that speed so I've taken the liberty of slowing it down to quarter speed. Now you may think that the jumpiness that you can see in the cut is all to do with me slowing down the video. But what I'd like you to do is look just behind the cut. There is a 
I think it's probably a cooling edge within the acrylic. You can see it rising up like a plume from the bottom edge. And if you watch that, that is absolutely continuous. There's no jumpiness in that plume. So I think without any shadow of a doubt, we can see that the, the cut is actually a jumpy cut. Despite the theory, I think that it's the stepper motor that's causing the problem because if we listen here, this is 50 millimetres a second. And here's what it sounds like at 100 millimetres a second. This is 200 millimetres a second. Okay, now this is five millimetres a second. Okay, we're now going to cut this at five millimetres a second. You can hear the stepper motor making a hell of a rattle as it's trying to stop, start, stop, start, stop, start. It's got the brakes and the accelerator on at the same time. going to run the same thing at 25 millimeters a second and we need to both listen and watch the way in which the head moves now I think you can clearly see in the cut in the background those striations I've polished the foreground face completely smooth so that you can uh, not get fooled by anything that's in front of it. And there we go, I've just broken the front section away so that you can see what the cut is actually like. And I think you can clearly see those marks in there where the, uh, where the cutting has been very intermittent. It sort of stops, rushes forward, stops, rushes forward. Because I don't think any doubt about it that despite the theory, the whole problem comes from the stepper motor and uh, basically it seems to give the impression that uh, if you want to get rid of these marks you've got to run as fast as possible. Well with all this newly acquired knowledge I think next time we're going to have to try and apply some of it to the 3D wood carving to see if we can get any improvements. So until then thanks for being patient and watching.